Hi, it's Dave, and we are going to talk about how different foods can cause or contribute to heartburn in this video. And I've um, broken down the different groups of foods uh, into a couple of different categories. They're only very loose categories, but just to, from an educational perspective, it's helpful just to break them down into two uh, major groups to explain the mechanisms by which these foods might contribute to heartburn and or acid reflux. So on the left hand side, we have um, foods that can irritate the stomach lining and cause inflammation and pain, which can then feel like um, your chest, uh, your heart, if you like, is on fire. So maybe some of these um, are familiar to you. Maybe you relate to some of these foods and you've had periods of time in your life or um, even perhaps now where when they, whenever you eat some of these foods, uh, you find that your symptoms worsen or you find that your symptoms are triggered. So irritant foods for the stomach lining include citrus fruits. So things like oranges, lemon, lime, even things like pineapple. I, I can sometimes, if I eat too much pineapple, just start to feel a little bit of irritation uh, in my chest area, which is where my stomach is, kind of just down here. Tomato can be a really big one as well. That's kind of one that doesn't often get mentioned. But tomato, uh, particularly tinned tomatoes that people use in cooking, sort of tomato paste, uh, tomato sauce, and things like that, they can be really irritating for some people and that can be a real big win when people avoid those foods and suddenly find that the heartburn symptoms just settle down a little bit. And the interesting thing is about, you know, sort of citrus and tomato, uh, most people would consider those foods as being quite healthy, but in certain circumstances, they can be very, very damaging to the stomach lining and they can really trigger a lot of discomfort. Salt and vinegar and spicy foods they're fairly obvious, right? So if you cut your finger, say a paper cut or something like that, and you then um, rub salt into it or pour vinegar on it or take chili spices and things like that and rub them in vigorously, there's going to be a lot of pain in that wound. So it stands to reason that perhaps salt, vinegar, spices, particularly the, you know, the hotter spices like chili and curry and what have you, can actually uh, exert a detrimental influence uh, when it comes to creating discomfort in uh, the stomach and the esophageal area. So they're really important. Fizzy drinks is another one that a lot of people don't think of too much because um, uh, they're not foods as such, they're just drinks. And if you think about it, what happens with uh, fizzy drinks, if, if you put them in your mouth, and you've got all of that fizz and bubbling away and you feel kind of that fizzy sensation in your mouth, it's actually the pain receptors in your tongue and in your gums that are uh, getting fired up by the bubbles bursting in your mouth. And that's, that's literally pain. So that fizzy sensation is actually a, a, a pain feedback mechanism. And so if you consume too many of those uh, fizzy beverages, you can elicit that pain uh, response in your stomach as well and that can lead to heartburn like symptoms. Then we have uh, gluten. Gluten is a, uh, a topic all on its own. There's probably one to two days worth of material on the potential uh, adverse health effects of gluten but being really specific to uh, the digestive system and particularly heartburn, in some people gluten can create an inflammatory response in the upper part of the small intestine and some people also think in the stomach as well and that inflammatory response can create um, you know a whole uh, range of different symptoms but particularly in the context of, of this video can create heartburn and reflux type symptoms and I've worked with people who have had heartburn for years and tried everything uh, and then as soon as they stop eating gluten, the heartburn goes away. Now that's not the case in every single person, but certainly trying a gluten-free diet can be really, really helpful and it's dead, uh, inexpensive and really easy to do. Similarly, they've shown in the scientific literature that cow's milk can create an inflammatory response in the stomach as well. They've shown this in infants and children, and certainly if it happens in infants and children, there's a possibility that it can happen in older people as well, adults, uh, adolescents, etc. And so cow's milk, again, um, the gluten and the cow's milk are such common foods, people are eating them by the bucket loads every day in most cases. 
and they can be just real simple obvious things to cut out of the diet for a while just to see if the symptoms start to improve and kind of along the lines of, of gluten and cow's milk the responses that people have to these foods are kind of allergic type responses. They often involve the immune system generating an inflammatory response to uh, the protein molecules in these foods. And so any food can potentially have a detrimental impact in terms of creating an allergenic response. There are uh, a stack of foods that are much more likely to do that than other foods are. Uh, sort of a top 10 allergenic uh, food uh, list if you like. We're not going to go into that uh, in this video, but funnily enough, they actually uh, encompass, if we talk about these allergenic foods, cow's milk is one, gluten and grains are another, uh, citrus fruits are another, uh, and in some cases tomato as well. So there's a kind of a link between potentially the irritating effects of these foods and the fact that they might be tied in with allergic responses in some cases. Now, just one final word on these irritating foods. If you already have irritation in the digestive system because of, for example, H. pylori or some kind of other inflammatory mediator or inflammatory trigger, um, the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin, um, if that's already hanging around in the stomach and then you pour these foods on top, that's one of the reasons why potentially they are problematic. And, and what's important to understand is that in that kind of situation, the food is only exacerbating an existing problem. If the stomach was intact and perfectly healthy in the first place, you might be able to have these foods without any problem whatsoever and them not cause any trouble. So if you do have any issues with these foods, you know you have a sensitivity to them and they trigger or exacerbate your heartburn symptoms, you might still want to look at digging a little bit deeper and figuring out why those foods are causing a problem. Because if the digestive system is in really good health, some of these foods shouldn't really cause too many problems unless you eat them excessively. Okay, on to the next category. We have foods that are called LES weakeners. LES stands for lower esophageal sphincter. And it, it, the easiest or crudest way to explain what the lower esophageal sphincter is, is basically like a bum hole, but it's up here and it separates your esophagus from your stomach. It opens out just like when you're taking a crap and it allows food to drop into the stomach and then it shuts. It should shut really tightly to stop the acid from splashing back up into your esophagus. If it's weakened for any reason or if it relaxes, then the acid can splash back up into your esophagus and call, cause a whole bunch of irritation, which you feel as heartburn. And so a whole bunch of different foods can weaken or relax the lower esophageal sphincter. And they are things like the excessive consumption of fats and oils, not just small amounts of fats and oils, usually, usually an excessive or high consumption of those foods, chocolate and coffee, and potentially things like black tea as well, mint, peppermint, spearmint, mint sweets, and things like that. They can cause problems. I sometimes notice that if I have too much mint tea or I eat too many mints, I can actually start to get a little bit of heartburn as a result of that. Onions and garlic can also uh, relax the lower esophageal sphincter if you have too many of them. Alcohol is a huge uh, LES relaxer and alcohol is also irritant and irritant as well. So it can have a double whammy, um, not to mention, of course, all the other adverse health effects that alcohol can have. And then sugar potentially as well, um, processed grains, things like that can also have a weakening effect on the lower esophageal sphincter. And finally, again, these allergenic foods can have a, an effect or an influence on whether that uh, lower esophageal sphincter stays nice and tightly closed or whether it opens out as well. So as you can see, there's you know, a good dozen or more different potential influences through different mechanisms uh, in terms of how foods might contribute to heartburn and reflux. And the pattern is probably gonna be different for every single person. So it's not easy to say, here are the foods that you need to avoid and here are the ones that you need to eat. What you really wanna be doing is experimenting and trying to figure out what your individual pattern is, whether these foods influence your symptoms or not. Now, in some cases, there are gonna be things that override the foods. 
H. pylori, for example, a hiatal hernia. If you have those things going on, sometimes changing your foods won't make any difference whatsoever. So foods are one possible trigger or cause for heartburn. In the following videos, we are gonna look at some of the other causes and teach you how to find out whether those causes are a problem for you and then fix them. So I hope that's been helpful. Try experimenting by eliminating as many of these foods as you can and see how you get on. Drop us an email, let us see how you're getting on and I will see you in the next video. Thank you.